Hi, welcome to this very interesting subject. I'm going to be talking today about drinking and gambling. <laughs> and a lot of Christians feel really guilty about drinking wine or about so-called gambling, meaning playing the lottery. Well, we're going to discover what does the Bible say about both. So the first subject I'll deal with is playing that lottery. Come on, admit it, we, most of us do that, you know, we're going to take our chance. But some of us feel like guilty. Don't know why we do, but we do. In fact, I did for a good long time because it depends on the preacher in the pulpit. And by the way, we've got some preachers uh, on this channel that sub me, this two. I had quite a few on my previous channel. And I always welcome comments from preachers. Um, they can email me, john at johntyler.com and, you know, just say, John, you're a heretic and you're just out to lunch and you have a big nerve trying to teach people how to gamble and drink. Well, you, again, you, if you dispute anything that I talk about in this Bible, you are welcome to bring it to my attention and I'll certainly listen to it. But I'm going to just say what is in my mind and it's never an opinion. It always comes out of this Bible. So lottery tickets. I have one here for Mega Bucks and Powerball. I bought one, so am I going to hell? There are actually some preachers that I've had in my life that I've listened to in my churches who said, if you gamble, you play the lottery, you're going to hell. You drink wine, you're going to hell. I say that because that's how they sounded. You know how preachers get. They, some of them are not preachers, they're yellers. They just yell you down until you finally just give in. But you know something, until you get into this Bible like the Apostle Paul told us, he said, you know, to the people at Thessalonica, he said, the people, the Berean Christians are more noble than you people in this church because they study the scriptures daily to know that what I, the Apostle Paul, is telling them is the truth. And that's what you should do and that's what I should do. So I'm just going to help you by doing my homework for you and then you decide what you want to do. Can I play the lottery? Can I drink wine? The answer is yes in both cases, so if you're all done, you can just click me off right now or you can know why it's okay. Now, lottery, that's a ticket that we buy to take a chance on winning something or getting something that's usually good or we wouldn't be paying the money for the ticket or taking the chance. Um, Matt, some of the preachers used to get mad and say, you know, you can't gamble because the soldiers at Jesus' death, right at his cross, cast lots, tickets if you will, for Jesus' clothing. Well, was that right? Was that nice? Probably not, but was it scriptural that they should cast lots? Absolutely yes. Now let's go find out why. The word lottery itself, the short word, this, the short word of lottery is lot, and it meant casting lots for, to get something. So lottery, lot. That's where we get the word lottery from. And it all started back in Leviticus 16.8 when Moses' brother Aaron cast two lots. Now let me tell you what a lot was. Obviously they didn't have tickets back then or they probably would have had lottery tickets. But they would gather stones from a brook or a river or something like that. Flat stones and the stones would be cast into a bag or a piece of clothing or a hat if you want to call it that now. And these stones would vary in flat stones and they would vary in size from small to large. 
And so there'd be a small stone, a little bigger, a little bigger, a little, all the way up to the large ones. They put those lots into a hat, let's say, <clears throat> and whoever was going to draw the lot, the ticket, would reach into the bag, take out the stone, and I'll show you how that worked in a minute. But I just wanted to tell you what a lot used to be. Today it's a ticket. In the very first instance in the Bible, it was called, it was small stones graduating up to larger stones. So you're with me so far. Okay. <clears throat> Leviticus 16.8. I'm going to throw the verse at you. I won't read it because I don't have the time. But you look it up, if you're a preacher especially. Leviticus 16.8 shows where Aaron, the brother of Moses, chose two stones, a small one and a large one, put them in his little sack, and he had two goats. One would be sacrificed <coughs> to the Lord, in other words, killed, and the other would be set free, and supposedly the sins of Israel would be like tied to the back, if you will, of this goat, and he would escape alive into the wilderness. So one would die, one would live, and the sins of Israel would go off out into the uh, wilderness to be, you know, um, they would escape from the punishment of the sin. That was called a, an escaped goat. We call, we say the word scapegoat today. Uh, he's a scapegoat, you know. <clears throat> but that's where that came from. So Aaron chose, and the one who, the goat who lost, was sacrificed, and the other one was set free and let go into the wilderness. So that's the first instance of two stones or lots being put into a bag. And uh, then later on in the book of Numbers, they, uh, they would give away the promised land. Do you remember the Israelites and they went into the promised land and Moses was in charge and then he never made it to the promised land so Joshua was. But what they did was they took lottery tickets called small stones or lots and they had ten in this particular instance of the Bible from small to large and they dump it in the hat and then the tribe leaders, there was only nine and a half tribes out of the twelve tribes of Israel who got to choose the land. I don't remember why, but I do remember the fact that it's in the Bible in Numbers 26, 55, if you'd like to go there. And they would reach into that hat and the one who got the winning ticket, if you will, the largest, the largest stone, would win the best land. So he was going to gamble, if you will, throw his, put, put his hand into the bag, pull out the stone, and the guy that got the largest stone got the best land, the guy that got the smallest stone got the stuff that nobody else got, or nobody else wanted, or nobody else won. So that little gamble was, you threw the tickets in the, the hat, and you pick your ticket, and the, the winning ticket won the big prize. So that's how lottery started, and uh, it kept going from there. King Saul, uh, well, let me go back to the lottery on the land. Joshua 14.2 also covers it, Joshua 18.11. Now, King Saul used the lottery system. Uh, they used to choose uh, governors by lottery. So they'd take a bunch of stones. It depended on how many guys showed up that wanted to be the governors of the local cities and so forth. And they'd... So if there was a hundred, then they would have a hundred stones of varying sizes from small to large and uh, a lottery ticket, if you will, dump it in the hat and then you were chosen the one with the largest stone got to be the governor of the best place. So he was the winner of the lottery, so to speak. The loser of the lottery was the guy that, you know, got the last crappy little village over there that nobody else wanted. Okay, so that's how, so we get it now. The lottery certainly started out way, way back in the Bible. Um, King David alluded to, he was a prophet as well. He alluded to Matthew 27, 35, which talks about those soldiers casting lots 
for Jesus' clothes. Um, somebody would certainly like to have those today. I wouldn't even know how much money they would be worth, but it would be like priceless. Uh, nonetheless, King David said in, in Psalm 22, 18, he said, uh, they will cast lots or hold a lottery, if you will, for the garments of Jesus. He predicted that way back in Psalm 22, 18, if you'd like to look that up. And that does reference Matthew 27, 35. Now, they would settle arguments by lottery. Did you know that? So if you had a dispute, you would go to a court system, which they just had like an administrator. And you would state your case, he would state his case, and then they would take, you would you'd reach into the bag, take out your lot, the, the one who had the largest stone or lottery ticket won the argument, and that was it. Case closed, that's it, see you later. Court is adjourned. Now, so they settled arguments. In the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 7, they found out who was the bad guy, who was the evil guy that brought all bad stuff that was happening on a particular boat. Um, and storms would come up and they would be on the boat and they'd say, look, one of us is just not uh, too lucky here. So let's draw lots to find out which one of us is bringing all this evil upon us in this ship. And the, the losing lot fell upon Jonah. You've heard the name, I got the luck of Jonah. Well, his luck ran out because they they discovered he was the, the one bringing the curses upon them. So they picked him up and threw him over the side of the boat. A big fish came by, swallowed him up. He lived in the belly of the big fish for three days. He landed on land because God wanted him over on the land at Nineveh to go preach to them. But anyway, that's how that lottery worked. Now, in the book of Nahum, N-A-H-U-M, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, they used to sell, or not sell, well, they'd sell slaves uh, way back in the day. And they could be, uh, you're thinking slaves as, you know, African slaves came over on the boat. We're talking way back, Israelite slaves, all kinds of slaves. And the biggest and the strongest ones were chosen by lottery. Now, I don't know if they graduated from stones to sticks or whatever they did, but something went from straws, small straw to big straw, but they just cut them up, whatever it was, into however many people were bidding on the slaves that were on the slave block. And the, the one that won the biggest, strongest slaves was the one that drew the largest stone or the largest straw or whatever you want to call it that had the winning ticket. You get it so far? I think you do. But we're not done because there is a downside to this thing called lottery. I'm going to cover that in one minute and then I'll get out of here for you. And then we're going to talk about wine next. Ooh, another evil thing. Um, Webster's Dictionary defines lottery as this, something that comes to someone who the lot has fallen on. See, they even get it. The lot, the lottery ticket, is something that comes to somebody. In this case, the recent one for mega millions, or one of them was $640 million. And that was divided in, uh, by three people. But the lot, if you will, the lucky ticket, the largest stone, fell upon uh, certain people and they won all the prize. Which is great. And everyone else that won, that played, that didn't win, obviously had the smaller stone. <clears throat> Not that they were losers, but they certainly didn't win the prize. But Webster says that it's just a lottery is something that comes to somebody who the lot has the lucky ticket, if you will, has fallen upon. Now, let me get into the crux of so-called gambling or playing the lottery. And that is motives. What is your motive for playing the lottery? Is it to gain millions of dollars so that you can go blow it on yourself? You know, you know already from some of my stories, I've had my millions of dollars. <clears throat> and I certainly blew a lot of that on myself with houses and cars and stuff. Anything I wanted, I bought. Or I usually, like the Mercedes, one of them I just paid 
$53,000 some odd dollars for it. And I just went to the dealership and said, mm, I like that one, I want that. Isn't that nice to be able to do that selfish person that I am? Now, since December of 2007, when the Lord changed my direction and put me on His, his path and, and showed me what His purpose and plan is for my life, my goal, now that He's taught me all about budgets, by the way, because He took all my money away back in December of in 2007, in January, February, March, and April of 2008, best thing He could ever do for me to teach me some lessons, but my goal is I now know why God gives us the ability to get wealth. And if you read Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, it is He, God, who gives you the power, or me, to gain wealth. But now, why would He give you wealth if you were, your motive is just to use the money for yourself? My goal is to give 90% of the money I get beyond my daily bread needs budget, which is my mortgage, my gas payments, and all that kind of stuff which God got me to, to better than that, I'm, so I'm doing a little better than budget on my regular income. Um, but nonetheless, that's the goal, and I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying that's the goal, is to give 90% to do what God says we should be doing with the money, and if we do, He'll bless us even further and give us more than we can handle, and I'm going to prove that, and God's going to prove that to me, and I'll share that with you, when that last chapter of my book that I'm finishing uh, comes to fruition, and then God will get all the glory, and Psalm 40 kicks into place, which means God gets all the glory for doing what He does. But you'll see it here first. But I like to prove things out, and I like to prove out that uh, God has a lot of promises in His Word, and He'll take care of you, but He's going to give you the money, or give me the money, only this time, only when we do what he says, which is take care of the poor, the orphans, the widows, and, uh, and we get set aside. I don't believe in tithing, because it's not scriptural in the New Testament, but there is a principle in the Old Testament about where the Israelites, the Jews, it costs 10% to run the temple. And uh, so they were required to give a tithe or 10% of their first fruits of their income. And a lot of the preachers today say, yeah, that's still all true, you're mandated to give a tithe. Look, that's a whole nother story, but no, you're not. Um, you give out of your heart, but based on the principle of tithing, um, when I get money in from selling commissions of real estate or whatever, I take 10% of that, just like it's my household budget items, and I give that for the purpose of operating my second home, which is the church, my church home, if you will. So, but these preachers are limiting the congregation and limiting God, and they don't trust God themselves because they're, they're browbeating everybody to give a tenth, and it's not there. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I want you to give because... In Luke 16, 9, it says, you give so that souls can be reached and souls will enter the kingdom of heaven and those same souls or friends will welcome you into heaven when you die and say, John or Mary or Joseph, it's because of you giving your money why I'm here and everybody's going to be happy. Just like the song I just sang. Uh, that circle will not be broken when we get to heaven later on and so forth and so on. And I hope to see you there. So, when you play the lottery, what is your motive? If it's selfish motives, good luck. If it's worth worthy motives, that, that still doesn't mean God's going to let you win the lottery. That's why it's called the lottery. It's uh, whoever the lot falls on gets the money. Okay, so can you gamble? Everything you do, you do in moderation. Um, can you buy a dollar lottery ticket? In my view, based on the scripture, yes, because that's where the word lottery came from, lot. Okay, so if you're with me on that, go help yourself and buy a ticket. If you still feel guilty, don't do it. That's all I can say.